Hello and welcome to the midweek edition of the Manchester is Red podcast. My name is Seb Parkinson, I'm your host today and in this midweek special we're going to talk through Manchester United's financial results month ending December the 31st 2023. I'm joined by Dave Powell, the Chief Business of Football Writer for Reach PLC. We're going to go through anything and everything about these results, what they mean, what they mean for FFP, PSR, what it means for transfers, what it means for the future of Manchester United, what it means for the Glazers, for Jim Ratcliffe, just everything to do with this, anything that we can find out. And Dave, who is, a, he, he doesn't like to be called an expert, but in my opinion, he's an expert in the field. Chief Business and Football Writer for Reach PLC. Dave, welcome, and uh, just give us a bit of an introduction about what you do and who you are. Yeah, I mean, it's... um. Uh, it kind of shows a sign of the times where we are with with football that, that there is even a business of football um, writer working working for the organisation. Um, yeah, business of sport, business of football is huge now. Um, people are more interested in where the money comes from than they ever have been um, because everything that comes into the club eventually trickles down in terms of how much have we got to spend on wages and transfers and, and ultimately that's that's the the be all and end all of it yeah so i've um i've been in this expanded role for um for, for about three and a half months now having worked at the echo in in a similar role in liverpool for for the last last three and a half years so yeah it's uh wide brief many clubs um but interesting nonetheless and uh, something that a lot of fans ask, and I say a lot, of, a lot of this on social media, is is why do some clubs, why do certain clubs post their financial results? Like, what what's the reason for it? Um, it's not all clubs. I mean, there's a there's a very select group of clubs in in world football that are um are publicly listed on on the stock exchange. Therefore, you know, the public can buy shares in them. And Manchester United are one of those. They're listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, traditionally over here, we have Companies House. Um, when we file results for businesses, which is a 12-month period. So there's a flurry of accounts coming out for football clubs at the moment because um, it is account season, uh, end of the financial year. For many, is May and June, so you're looking back 12 months. Now, being on the uh, being publicly listed on the stock exchange, uh, you are duty-bound to your investors and your shareholders to provide them with accurate and up to, more up-to-date um, reporting uh, so, so as they can know how their investment stands. And that's basically it. So United do, you know, they have four quarterly reports. So I love all three quarterly reports and a full year report. So um so yeah, that's 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 the long and the short really. It's because it's it's very much to um for investors to be able to see how their asset or their investment is performing over a over a period of time, but in more granular detail uh in the shorter time frame rather than having to wait every twelve months for an update, which is actually twelve months out of date. From from the previous financial year, anyway. And United United sit on a debt <clears throat> at the moment of seven hundred and seventy three point three million pound at the time of recording. A debt which only ever seems to be growing. Like how can this be sustainable? And why are the Glazer family allowed to do this? Why is it allowed to happen? Because they can service it. Really, I mean, it's um, if you can service debt, you can have debt. Um, Tottenham Hotspur's debt is. Bigger than United, I think uh, that's getting close to eight hundred and odd, close to a billion, maybe. Uh, but that that is attributed to the building of the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, um, which was completed in two thousand nineteen. So that is uh, there's good debt and bad debt. Um, good debt is will largely be seen as what Spurs did um, because they'll event. I mean, I think they got a thirty year mortgage on that um, on that, that that debt on the stadium. So by the time they clear through that, it's kind of everything is just. You know, pure profit over and above that. Um, Arsenal did the same. They 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 dug themselves into a little bit of a hole in the late two thousands, early two thousands, um, at the expense of signing players because they had a lot of debt because they built uh, the Emirates Stadium. Um, that's now been cleared ahead of time. So so their their fortunes will change in the future. In United's case, obviously the Glazers lo- purchased the club um, through debt, so um, it was a leverage buyout. So. Difference being that there was never kind of a penny of, of of their own money which went into it. It was it was debt financed, um, and that obviously rankles with with supporters, understandably. Um, but United are always able to service their debt; they don't miss debt payments. But um, and and that debt figure kind of fluctuates. I think it it dropped fifty odd million in the current reporting period due to interest rate changes, etc. Um, but it still remains this kind of ugly millstone around the, the club's neck, which fans would would rather didn't exist. But in terms of them being able to 
to purchase players, it's not impactful because it's not in a profit and loss every single year. That, I mean, when we talk about PSR, I know we'll probably discuss that later, and um, that's looked at over kind of a three-year period, and that doesn't really come into it. So, um, so yeah, it's it's a it's a ugly thing I think around the neck of United, which fans would rather they didn't have, but ultimately it's not um, impactful for them signing players until such time that they are unable to meet um, the kind of the repayments and the interest repayments um, of which there is no, no sign or suggestion that they'll ever be able to do that because United are in the position um, to be able to, as one of the big, you know, biggest clubs in the world to be able to, to kind of secure um, against uh, kind of future media revenues and things like that. So, um, so there's no, no concern in that respect. It's just a kind of an unpalatable thing to have. So on the next quarter results, you had obviously that in the Champions League anymore. You got knocked out in the group stages. So there's 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 not even like a last sixteen revenue or anything in there. So what can we expect the next quarter results to look like, and how much of Jim Ratcliffe's investment will that will that show? Because could that, you know, that might skew the results, perhaps. We've already had 156 million, I think, shown um, in these filings from from the first tranche of, of investment of, of kind of capital, which has come from in, um, Ratcliffe's investment. I think there's another 78, 80 million to follow. Um, in the next one, yeah, I mean it's impactful. Um, not being in the Champions League, it's uh, you know not only is it the prize money which is accrued th- through the round, it's also the fact that you are adding additional games um, to to your schedule, which is which is valuable. So um, match day revenue tends to fluctuate greatly when when clubs do well in competitions. So even whether it's the um, the Carabao Cup, the FA Cup, or, or the Champions League. I mean, the more home games you get in a, in a competition, the more chance there is to earn money. Because, you know, if you are United, if you are um, Liverpool, you are selling out the stadium um, for a home game. It doesn't really make any difference what competition it is. So the value in that is still there. So, um, so yeah, that that will be that will be where the fluctuation happens. I mean, missing out on additional prize money, etc. But. Um, that's the, the the curious thing about um, when when kind of clubs base base their, their kind of revenue model off doing well in, in competition because it, it isn't always the case. I mean, um, you can miss out on the Champions League one year, you can miss out on on European football altogether. I mean, Chelsea are going to have to carry the can for that further on down the road from the fact that their their business model when the club was purchased by um, Todd Bowley and Clear Lake Capital was to um, be a regular fixture in European football. Now they seem quite quite far away away from that so um so yeah i mean that'll be those will be the the main kind of triggers but we should see the second tranche of that jim jim ratcliffe investment happen but when you're looking at quarterly statements you are i mean you see in small shifts it's not like when we see the full year and we, we see these huge swings i mean it, it's, it's kind of nip, nip and tuck here and there Uh, Jim Ratcliffe's called upon the government uh, to fund a Wembley of the North um, to the man on the street, and you know the public have basically been asked to 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 pay for it, pay for some of it. So, so for what percentage of um, of this stadium rebuild could the public purse be expected to pay? How much, you know, how much taxpayers' money would the government be looking to invest if if you can even put a figure on it? Hard to say a percentage of it, really. I mean the. Um... It's been a case previously made. So if you go back to the mid nineteen nineties, Manchester City tried to um, get government funding to build uh, a stadium, which they wanted to become the Wembley North. When they were they were thinking about going for the uh, Atlanta Gate, what, what what was the Atlanta Olympic Games in nineteen ninety six? Manchester tried to bid for that, so they tried they they wanted to get secure some government funding for that. Um, now, as we look towards, you know, we've got kind of the leveling up initiative. Um, through government and things like that, so the this this notion of of building kind of a another national stadium has been kicking around for for quite a while now. Newcastle want to do the same thing, so in the kind of the days and weeks after Jim Ratcliffe and United announced that they wanted to pursue this type of course of action, um, Newcastle are also considering a similar thing, um, and they'll be thinking, why not in you know. Why not at the very north of England? Why does it have to be Manchester? Why is it, you know? And, and then Birmingham are probably thinking, why Manchester? Aston Villa are probably thinking, why have we not pursued this earlier? Given the fact that we have this t- uh, tag as a second city, but Manchester's always had appeal because of location, um, population, transport links, um, all that. So it's appealing. But 
it, United have to make a compelling case for it as to why this is actually needed. You know, there's a huge regeneration project which is going to, going to be undergoing in um, in the area, um, which is going to take take several years, but ultimately will will kind of raise um, the kind of the economic benefit around the area of that. Um, it's about making a compelling case. Um, do you know? And it's hard to put a figure on what percentage that it'd look for, um, but they'd look to get a, you know kind of a decent chunk of it bit paid down if it was going to mean they. Say they pay, they you know England play a set number of games there. But is there is there the appetite from that um, from kind of central government, given the fact that Wembley has its headquarters in, in uh, the FA has its headquarters at Wembley? Um, it, getting all these things to align. I mean, Jim Ratcliffe's vision is one thing, uh, and what he'd like to see. But in, in you know, as as kind of these things happen, the, there is a um, usually in a trend, entrenched belief. Um, of how things should be done centrally from London, and it's how you try and break that. Um, now, if, if the government or whichever government will be, and you know, we'll, we'll know that later back into the year, um, are serious about kind of leveling up and, and creating greater economic opportunity uh, in the north of England, then then maybe that could, you know, investment in something like this could be a flagship. But then other clubs would be thinking, why, you know. Is, is this not just to the benefit of Manchester United? And I suppose it, it poses more questions than, than it answers. I mean, it answers one great question for United. How do we fund this great new stadium, which will make us lots and lots of money? But um, the the kind of the range of questions which would, would kind of they would encounter from um, not only the taxpayer, but um, other football clubs in the Premier League, um, other, other local uh, authorities that would probably want to see a national, if there's going to be another national stadium, why can't it be a... Uh, kind of just a, a general one um, as opposed to why does it have to be someone's home? You know, why couldn't it be a, you know, why isn't it in Birmingham, et cetera? So there's all these questions which would be re- uh, kind of arise, but it's um, it's it's hard, it's impossible to put a figure on, on, on what would be put to it in terms of taxpayer money, but um, it would it would require a lot of selling in order to get it done anyway. Yeah, and United Stadium looks set to cost around two billion pound at the time of recording again because we know that this figure fluctuates. We've seen what happened with HS two, where the figure just kept going up and up and up. How would the club fund such a proposal, given the the debt? You know, the seven hundred seventy three million pound worth of debt just doesn't seem to be being shifted anywhere. How how, how would that happen? It all depends on on your access to to capital, really. So. Um... You've got Jim Ratcliffe, who's you know one of the one of the well one of the richest men in Britain, but also one of the richest men in the world. Um, these while, while we talked before about debt and things like that, these are you know heavy hitting family offices and businessmen who with huge huge organisations that have access to capital and good credit ratings. So um, that's how it works. You know, you 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 go you go and try and find funding for these things. It's who has the appetite for it and how and where do they see the returns coming from? So um, it's kind of a different situation going on in Italy at the moment. So just to use it as a contrast, um, the AC Milan are looking to build a new stadium because AC Milan and Inter Milan are going their separate ways um, from the San Siro, and they're both pursuing separate projects for different reasons. Now, AC Milan's vision is to have a national stadium like Italy hasn't had. So they want to get a lot of that funded from, um, from part funded from government if they can, but they also are going to require, ca- you know, capital commitment from, from other lenders. So, um, so yeah, if, if raising the debt won't be an issue for, for, for someone like United. It'll be, um, you know, they're, they're kind of, they're a strong business model, a, a football club brand, which endures. Um, they, are kind of an uncorrelated asset, which means that they, as you know, so so kind of geopolitical things which happen. So whether it's COVID or rising interest rates, etc., these are assets which kind of remain stable-ish um, along that course. So so if there's you know if this is you know you only have to look at the impact of the pandemic to clubs in the main. I know they they incurred losses, but they managed to ride it out because if people have got money. Um, They'll carry the one thing they'll be loath to stop spending on is, in in many cases, the one thing they enjoy, which is the football. So, so these are kind of they've got such such a sticky kind of fan base um, in football that it's you know it, it just won't fall fall off a cliff. It just won't, and the, and that's attractive to to people who invest in football because they know that it will still be here and it'll still be a, a strong asset in five, ten, fifteen, twenty years time. So there won't be too much issue with raising um, raising debt around that. 
It's common knowledge that the Glazers use the club's money, not their own money, the club's money to fund uh, the the strategic review with the employment of Rain to the tune of £9.6 million. Why did that come from the club's bank account? Why have they not why have they not paid for that themselves? No, it's important for me to to, to state here that I'm a I've, I've no skin in the game here. I'm a I'm a Chester fan. So, um, but uh, the ownership of the Glazers is, has been kind of a bit of a black mark on, on English football, given the way it happened um, through kind of that leverage buyout, and it has been a case of how how not to own a football club. Really, um, no Premier League titles in, in more than a decade. They've allowed the, the biggest testament to the fact that what they've done to United is the fact that Old Trafford, we're still talking about a redeveloped Old Trafford now, um, almost 20 years after they arrived. You look around their rivals, um, FSG have, have probably finished that Liverpool revamp as much as they're going to. Um, they looked at a new stadium first thing they did when they bought the club. Um, Spurs have a new stadium. Um, Man City uh, latched onto the back of the uh, Commonwealth Games to redevelop the Etihad. Um, Arsenal have a new stadium, uh, which was built in the past 15 years. United still has um, Old Trafford, which, you know, the famous leaky roof and things. It's, it's kind of been a testament to the it kind of the the Glazer ownership. Now, if a, an ownership group is willing to not put any of their own money in to buy the football club, then they sure as hell aren't going to put their own money in to um, facilitate a business transaction which um, involves the football club, so they've no um, they've no qualms about um, taking money from the club. They take dividends from the club. The club still spends, is their argument. They still spend the transfer market. That's that would be the get out saying, well, we still spend on wages. We have the highest wage bill. Um, well, it's going to be the highest wage bill next season. I think the Premier League when the Champions League money kicks back in, and. That's all very, um, very good and well, but they've taken hundreds of millions out of the football club. Now they're not going to have any qualms about sticking one in the eye of fans again and, and taking uh, and, and making the club pay for this kind of rain transaction. That's just a cost of business for them, and this is a business. It's not an emotional connection they have with the football club. It is purely um, a business transaction, and this is their business. So they have no problems with um, parting with that cash as bleak as that sounds that is that is the be all and end all yeah, that's it and finally to finish just want to just run through the PSR and FFP situation how do you see this affecting United's transfer allocation if a stadium rebuild was to go ahead Surely the cost of building a new ground would eat, would eat up most of the, if not all of the transfer allowance, or, or or do they have some sort of special dispensation with FFP and PSR for infrastructure? I take the point. The Arsenal one was a bit different. Um, Arsenal's revenues weren't as high, weren't like United's um, are now. So when they were trying to balance being competitive with building a new stadium, um, they had to have good cash flow as well. And also that, I mean, they still spent money, but it still required them to think a bit Bit, bit more about how that money was allocated, where it was going, how they were spending it, because they had um, a huge commitment on, on a stadium build. Um, now, PSR, um, as it stands at the moment, so it's going to get changed, whether it's next year, year after, it, it's going to be done as in its current guise. So you have um, 105 million of allowable losses over a three-year period. Uh, of that sum, most many clubs go over that 105 million. Not all of them, many of them. Um of that, you're allowed to deduct stuff, such things as infrastructure. So if, if you're Spurs, Spurs have got the best PSR position of anyone in the Premier League because that £800 million worth of debt attributed to the stadium um, is infrastructure. So deduct that straight away. Uh, then you have investment in the women's game, um, community projects and the academy. So, so things like that, you can deduct, deduct all that. Um, now, that's going to be replaced by something in line with UEFA's um, squad cost ratio rule, which is where, which again is is closely trying to, the idea is to try and curb spend on transfers. So so they don't want to curb investment in football clubs in, into the actual club itself. So investment into the bricks and mortar, uh, the academies, uh, the women's game community, um, it'd have to be some pretty bad rules to, to kind of curb spending on investing in all that. So you're, whatever rules are implemented, 
um, you will still be allowed to invest heavily in all of those things and not impacting your transfer spend. Uh, now, UEFA's squad to us ratios rule is uh, it's transfer spend uh, and wages and agents fees um, against revenue as a percentage. So transfer fees um, accounted for by the amortization costs, which is obviously when you sign a player, um, the guaranteed sum of that deal is is divided over the, the length of the contract, which is now limited to five years. Um, so there'll be no there'll be no barriers in place to to stop investment in in bricks and mortar. So if United wanted to build a two billion pound stadium, as long as they had the cash flow to be able to to fund transfers, which they would because they have huge revenue streams, um, it wouldn't be a problem. Um, wouldn't be impactful. Um, Spurs again, slightly different case because revenue revenue is much lower um, than than United and the rest. Um, they built the stadium to try and bridge that gap and get closer to United, um, City and Liverpool. So that's the that, that's kind of the flip side of the coin there. Um, but no, it won't be impactful to, to United to spend into it to a great degree. Um, but I do think that we will eventually, probably going down a different path here, but um, start moving to a, a point whereby we start to think differently about the transfer market because people who are coming in are largely now are trying to run businesses um, and create strong revenue streams, but all that kind of falls by the wayside. The Premier League, when you just kind of clubs put a gun to their head and just blow their brains out in the transfer market, um, that's just what happens. The transfer market is just crazy. Um, it it's but and, and North American ownership in particular has a real problem um, trying to mesh what it how, what works in North America with what works in in England um, and Europe because they have cost control there through salary caps and. Uh, no promotion, relegation, etc. So, but yeah, I mean, United's to be able to spend, but I do think we're probably going to push towards clubs trying to reduce wage bill and transfer spend, which I think probably chimes with what um, Jim Ratcliffe, his vision for United is to spend less on transfers and wages, um, but yet raise success through smarter recruiting um, and better use of funds. Brilliant. Well, thank you for joining me, Dave. Really appreciate your time. For anybody that wants to get in touch with Dave, Dave, just just give them a lowdown of where to find you and and, and your newsletter. Yeah, so it's um, on on X. I'm, uh, it's under at, at underscore Dave Powell, and we uh, there's a a weekly newsletter, the uh, the bottom line, um, which kind of focuses on the business of football, um, a bit more kind of in depth, a bit more granular detail about. Um, not not so much telling you what has happened, but why why it's happened, why it matters, uh, and where we're going where we're going with with football and, and sports business really, and trying to make uh, a little bit of sense out of out of it all. But um, but yeah, subscriptions uh, most welcome. Excellent stuff, right? Well, like I say, if you want to follow Dave, go and join his Substack. Subscriptions are welcome, as he says. Uh, we'll be back on Friday with the usual suspects on the Manchester's Red podcast to preview Manchester United's FA Cup quarter final with Liverpool. See you then.